they buried Sayyid Abdul Karim's hand somewhere under an acacia tree on the highway outside Tonk in Rajasthan. The pot-bellied carpenter had been demonstrating a new kind of simple homemade gun that he hoped would arm a generation of jihadists to wage war against India. Instead, it blew up. Karim would come to be known both to his fellow jihadists and to the intelligence and police officers hunting him down as Tunda or the Cripple. Thank you for joining the Prince Explorer yet again. Today we are going to be taking a close-up look at India's jihadist movement and why it's re-emerged time and time and time again over the decades. Earlier this week, police in Bengaluru arrested Sayyid Shabir, who they suspect may have been linked to the bombing of the Rameshwaram cafe in Bengaluru some weeks back. According to police, Shabir was linked to four fugitives who were involved in an earlier attack in Mangalore. The cell, they think, built the pressure cooker that went off inside an auto rickshaw before it could be planted at a temple in the city. The real question is, why are Islamic State modules still surfacing in India so long after the Islamic State's caliphate itself disappeared? Is it something to do with Islam itself, as some argue? Is the internet responsible for radicalizing young people to involve themselves in foreign causes and extremism? Or are there more complex forces that we need to think about even if it involves some painful introspection. One of my favourite questions at lectures I give is, when do you think the first suicide attack in India took place? I'm going to pause for a second while you think about that and tell you about its story. The killings at the church began after mid-morning mass, carried out by just two young armed men, armed with knives, who had mingled among the worshippers. In dozens of other places around the world today, we have seen similar scripts play out. Violent attacks carried out by terrorists, inspired by the name of God and his self-proclaimed regents on earth. Yet, this particular attack took place not in the 21st century, but in March 1764 at the Portuguese colonial port of Dharmapatnam on the Malabar coast. Like the US Special Forces who killed Osama bin Laden, the guards at the Dharmapatnam church wanted to erase the killers from history. A contemporary account of that 1764 attack records, The bodies of the above Moors were immediately ordered to be thrown into the sea as an example to deter others from the like attempts in future and to prevent any religious, there's one word missing, being got of them so that they may not be worshipped as saints as is the practice by their caste, by all who murder a Christian. Two and a half centuries on, as Indians contemplate the rise of the Islamic State, the story of the suicide attackers of Dharmapatnam helps illuminate the macabre theatre of death ISIS has unleashed. Though jihadist violence in India seems to have exploded in just recent decades, it in fact has deep roots in our political and cultural landscape. The Dharmapatnam suicide attackers were driven by an understanding of Islam much as today's jihadists were. But their response was only one of many responses by Muslims of the Malabar coast to the new situation they found themselves in in the 18th century. At that time, Portuguese colonialism was destroying the monopoly Malabar Muslims had held of the spice trade with the Persian Gulf. The idea of a jihad became an important means of resistance just as the idea of Christianity provided legitimacy for Portuguese colonialism. Languages of religion and languages of politics reinforced each other. There would be other ideas of jihad, the scholar Aisha Jalal has shown, through the 18th and 19th century. There would be rebellions against the Sikh empire centered around the idea of jihad. Other iterations would break out against the British during the great rebellion or 
first war of independence in 1857. In the 1920s, thousands of Indian Muslims would migrate from the Gangetic Plains to Afghanistan, seeking to live under a Darul Islam or a, a land of Islam instead of a Darul Harb or land of war as they understood British India to be. The migrants hoped to find an Islamic utopia awaiting them. Instead, many ended up dead, looted and killed by the tribes of what is now the Northwest Frontier Province in Pakistan. Through the 19th century, there were rebellions by the Mapilas of Kerala for whom Islam became a means to resist both their landlords and the East India Company. Mapila insurgency would culminate in 1921 with brutal violence against Hindu landlords and Hindu uh, temples, which even today colours much of Kerala with bitterness. Abdul Karim Tunda was the inheritor of this complex legacy. The son of a metal casting artisan, Kareem grew up in very difficult circumstances. Forced to drop out of a missionary run school at the age of 11 when his father died, he was put to work making cartwheels for his uncle. He later travelled across North India as an itinerant worker, serving as a cobbler, a carpenter, a barber, and a bangle maker. In 1964, Kareem married Zarina Yusuf, the daughter of his uncle. For the next two decades, he lived a conventional lower middle class life, working as a trader in dyed cloth and bringing up three children. Karim responded to the communal strife unleashed across India by the Ram Janmabhoomi movement in the 1980s by discovering religion for the first time. He turned to the neo-fundamentalist Ehle Hadith sect for answers to the question of why Muslims in India seemed to him to be passive victims of communal violence. That search led him in 1984 to Ahmedabad, where he began preaching Islam at a small seminary. He got married again during that time after his first wife refused to accompany him and fathered a fourth child. He also had the experience that would shape his worldview, witnessing the communal riots of 1985 firsthand. In later testimony to police, Karim described how Zafar Rahman, one of his in-laws, had been burned alive along with seven other relatives. He talked of shops burned down, a mosque destroyed and a police force that had joined a mob in attacking Muslims. For weeks after the riots, Karim discussed the issue with an elderly local cleric, Malvi Wali Muhammad. He segregated himself to study verses of the Quran on jihad. Karim emerged determined to protect his faith. He worked with a local vendor of fireworks to produce low-grade explosives using potash, sugar and sulfuric acid packed into steel pipes. Karim was far from the only Indian Muslim during this period of the 80s with the same ideas. Ever since he'd been a medical student, Jali Sansari would later tell police, he'd heard Hindus jabbing Muslims with communal invective. I quote, branding us as traitors and Pakistani agents. From his clinic in a municipal hospital in Mumbai, Ansari read of the breakout of riot after riot in Muradabad, Merat, Bhagalpur and Bhivindi. He saw what had happened in Bhivandi first hand as a volunteer distributing medical supplies to the victims. In 1985, Dr. Ansari met the man who gave shape to his ideas, a former Maoist in Karim Nagar called Azam Ghori. The fifth of 11 children from an impoverished family, Ghori too had discovered religion in the early Hadith, just like Tunda. These men later set up an anti-riot vigilante group called the Tanzim Islahul Muslimin, or TIM, Organization for the Correction of Muslims. Initially, the group consisted of volunteers in Mumbai's Mominpura slum, who trained in rudimentary self-defense using lathis. Inflamed by the communal violence that ripped apart Bhivandi in 1985, the activist discussions though soon turned to reprisal. In the late 80, 1980s, the TIM's activities barely merited an entry in the local police station's diaries of local events. Mimicking the drills of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh's militias, Ghori, Hosseini, Abdul Karim Tunda paraded their recruits around the grounds of the Young Men's Christian Association. 
most of the TIM's membership consisted of young Mominpura residents who were angered by communal discrimination and violence. But on December 6, 1992, the day Hindu fundamentalist mobs demolished the Babri Masjid, this small group decided the time had come to act. Flying the banner of the Mujahideen Islam e Hind, exactly one year after the Babri Masjid was destroyed, Jalis Ansari organized a series of 43 bombings in Mumbai and Hyderabad and seven, seven separate attacks on intercity trains. Most jihadist groups in India can trace themselves back in a direct lineage to that group. These new groups were largely to draw their cadre from an organization called the Students Islamic Movement of India or SIMI. Like many other South Asian Islamist movements, SIMI's genesis lay in the jamaat e islami Established in 1941 by Abul Allah Maududi, the jamaat e islami went on to emerge as a major political party in Pakistan which fought for the creation of a Sharia-governed state. In India, however, the Jamaat gradually transformed itself into a cultural political organization committed to propagating Islam against Mus amidst Muslims. It set up networks of schools and study circles uh, devoted to combating the growing post-independence influence of communism and socialism among the Muslim community. A student wing, the Students' Islamic Organization, was set up in 1956 with its headquarters in Aligarh. Simi was formed in 1977 as an effort to revitalize the SIO in the post-emergency climate of openness and democratization. Building on the SIO student network, Simi reached out to Jamaat-linked Muslim students group in various states. Simi made clear its belief that the practice of Islam was essential to its political project. In the long term, Simi sought to re-establish an Islamic caliphate without which it felt the practice of Islam, the religious Islam, was impossible. Its pamphlet warned that Muslims comfortable living in a secular society were headed to hell. Ideologies other than Islam were condemned as false and unlawful. Mawdhuti's writings were at the core of this vision. As the scholar Sayyid Wali Raza Nasser has pointed out, Mawdhuti's reading of the Quran led him to believe that, and I quote, an important aspect of the Prophet's organization had been segregating its community from its larger social context. This enabled the Prophet to give his organization a distinct identity and permitted the nascent Muslim community to resist dissolution into the larger pagan Arab culture. Instead, they were able to pull their adversaries into the ambit of Islam. For Mawdhuti, the Jamaat, much like the prophetic community, had to be a paragon for the Muslim community in India. Developments in Pakistan and elsewhere, like the Jihad which erupted after the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan, gave this project an increasingly sharp edge. As the scholar Yogins, Yoginder Sekand has noted, Simi's rhetoric grew combative and vitriolic, insisting that Islam alone was the solution to the problems not just of the Muslims of India, but to all Indians and indeed of the world. In 1982, for example, Simi organized an anti-immorality week where supposedly obscene and secular literature was burned. Simi also worked extensively with victims of communal violence and provided educational services for poor Muslims. Simi's hardline language appealed to a growing class of lower middle class and middle class urban Muslim men who in the 1980s felt cheated of their fair share of economic opportunities. In Simi's vision, the discrimination these young men experienced was intrinsic, not an aberration from the Indian secular nationalist project. As Yuginder Sikand has noted, the organization provided its supporters with a sense of power and agency which they were denied in their actual lives. Simi's tilt to terrorism began around the period of the Babri Masjid. Remember exactly the same time when Sayyid Abdul Karim and his group were conducting their first bombings. Simi President Shahid Badar Falahi demanded that, I quote, Muslims organize themselves to stand up for the community. Another Abdul Aziz Salfi 
demanded action to show that Muslims, I quote, would now refuse to sit low. And what did that mean? Acting on these calls, growing numbers of SIMI members left the organization which they thought was all talk and no action and made their way to Lashkar-e-Taiba, Jaish-e-Mohammed and Harkatul jihad islami training camps in Pakistan. In a 1996 statement, SIMI declared that since democracy and secularism had failed to protect Muslims, the sole option left was to struggle for a caliphate. Soon after, the movement put up posters calling on Muslims to follow the path of the warlord, medieval warlord Mahmud Ghaznavi um, and appeal to God to send down a latter-day avatar of the 11th century conqueror to avenge the destruction of mosques in India. When 25,000 Simi delegates met in Mumbai in September 2001 at what was to be its last public convention, the organization for the first time called on its supporters explicitly to turn to jihad in an article published just after the convention, the commentator Javed Anand recalled seeing stickers splashed, I quote, on large numbers of Muslim shops and homes with a thick red no splashed across the words democracy, nationalism, po polytheism. Soon after the convention, Al-Qaeda carried out its attacks in New York and Washington. Simi -og activists organized demonstrations in support of Osama bin Laden, hailing him as a true mujahid, and celebrating the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas by the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. Early in 2004, a group of young men, mostly almost all one-time members of SIMI, gathered for a retreat at one of the sprawling villas around the cheerfully named Jolly Beach, the pride of the small South Indian town of Batkal. They swam, went for hikes in the woods, honed their archery skills and occasionally indulged in some target practice with an air gun. Local residents were later to recall that they'd heard some small explosions, but assumed the men were setting off fireworks. Nothing the young men did gave the Bhatkal police, such as it was, any cause for concern. It should have. The young men on Jolly Beach formed the core of what came to be known as the Indian Mujahideen, which would carry out India's most successful and lethal urban terror uh, attacks from 2008 five onwards. Hundreds were killed and injured. Riyaz Ismail Shahbandri, who became famous by his alias Riyaz Bhatkal, along with his brother Iqbal, signed a manifesto issued by the Indian Mujahideen after its September 2008 bombings in New Delhi. And this is what it said. We, the Indian Mujahideen, ask Allah the Almighty to accept from us these explosions, which were carried out to be executed in the holy month of Ramzan. We have carried out this attack in the memory of the two most eminent Mujahids of India, Sayyid Ahmad Shaheed and Sayyid Shah Ismail, who raised the glorious banner of jihad against the disbelievers of this very city of Delhi. And who were they? 19th century jihadists who we discussed earlier. Riyaz Shahbandri's father, um, Ismail Shahbandri, left Bhatkal some three decades prior in the hopes, like millions of other Indians, of making his fortune in Mumbai. He set up a successful leather tanning works in the city's Kurla area and eventually bought an apartment in Kardar buildings off the busy Tulsi Pipe Road. An impossible dream then as now for most migrants to the city. Ismail Shabandri's prosperity ensured Riyaz Shabandri was able to study at local English medium schools and later obtained a civil engineering de degree from Mumbai's Sabu Siddiqui Engineering College. He married a Bhatkal area woman. But by this time, Riyaz's trajectory began to diverge from that of his father. He was looking for meaning, not just some a living. Shafiq Ahmad, Riyaz's future brother-in-law, lived in the family's apartment as he pursued his studies. Shafiq was a member of SIMI and introduced Riyaz to the organization. Riyaz began spending time in Simi's offices around 2001, at the peak of its radical phase, with men who would play a key role in the development of the jihadist movement's next phase. Among them were Abdul Subhan Qureshi and Muhammad Sadiq Israr Sheikh, who later co-founded the Indian Mujahideen. Also, Etesham Siddiqui, Rahil Sheikh, 
names who were critical to the development of the jihadist movement and to attacks in other parts of India. Sadiq Isra Sheikh, an air conditioning mechanic, had no conception of the jihadist movement or politics when he began attending Simi meetings at a friend's apartment in 1996. Over tea and biscuits, the dead discussions formed the basis for the birth of the Indian Mujahideen. From his testimony much later to Mumbai police investigators, Sheikh appears to have been drawn to Simi's political Islamism by the same resentments common to millions of lower middle class Mumbai residents. Born in 1978 to working class parents from the North Indian city of Azamgarh, Sheikh grew up in the Cheetah Camp housing project in Trombay. Sheikh's parents were able to give their children a decent home and an education. But the young man dropped out of high school, obtained certification as an air conditioning mechanic. He could find only ill-paid freelance work, not a regular job. Like many of his contemporaries, Sheikh blamed his economic problems on communalism. In 1993, communal riots tore the city apart and killed hundreds of Muslims. Simi gave voice to Sheikh's anger. In 2001, Sheikh ran into a distant relative who turned his jihadi dream into reality. Salim Islahi, the son of a Jamaat-e-Islami linked cleric who was expelled from the organization for his extremism, put Sheikh in touch with the gang lord Aftab Ansari. Aftab Ansari, in turn, arranged for Sheikhs to travel to Pakistan in September 2001. Abdul Subhan Qureshi, like Sheikh, was the son of working class migrants from North India. Qureshi again received a good education, ironically at the Catholic-run Antonia D'Souza High School, and in 1996 began work as a software engineer. He joined Simi around the same time though, disturbed by communal violence in Mumbai. Later, he edited a Simi-affiliated journal called Islamic Movement. In 2001, he submitted a letter of resignation to his employers, saying he intended to, I quote from the letter, devote one complete year to pursue religious and sp uh, spiritual matters. Actually, he also travelled to Pakistan to receive weapons training. This first group of is Indian Mujahideen members returned from Pakistan in 2002, by when, you know, massive riots had broken out in Gujarat. Those riots led dozens more volunteers to sign up with the Indian Mujahideen. Many came from Hyderabad for training, um, many others from Maharashtra and from Azamgarh itself. In 2005, this network was ready to carry out their first bombings, an attack on a Hindu temple in the North Indian city of Varanasi. Over coming years, the Indian Mujahideen succeeded in staging strikes of ever grating intensity, among them the July 2006 bombings of Bombay's suburban train system that claimed 183 lives. The network would eventually be crushed by investigators, but that wasn't the end. Late one morning in the summer of 2014, Arib Majid left his home in Kalyan, a suburb of Mumbai, and never returned. His father, Ijaz Badruddin Maji, the soft-spoken homeopathic practitioner, later found a letter saying Arib had left for Iraq to join the jihad there. I quote from the letter, Fighting has been enjoyed upon you, though it is hateful to you. In a note to his mother, Arib further explained the angel of death would ask why he didn't migrate to Allah's land to fulfill that command. May we all meet in paradise, that letter said. Fahad Tanvir Sheikh, Aman Naim Tandel and Shaheem Farooq Tanki had also left with Arib to join the Islamic State. They had all left maudlin notes to their families and there would be more and more as the clock ticked on. These texts were populated almost without exception with religious cliches drawn from the many Islamist sites on the internet. The evidence makes clear that while the four Thane jihadists were part of a relatively small fringe, India sent far fewer jihadists to the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda than neighbouring countries like Pakistan or the Maldives, let alone European and West Asian countries. This fringe 
was a growing one. India's intelligence services estimated that perhaps a hundred Indian nationals travelled to West Asia for jihad. Some of them were members of the Indian Mujahideen who successfully fled India after the police crackdown. Others were young graduates, even doctors, engineers from Kerala, Maharashtra, other parts of the country. Ever since those men went abroad, some with their families, India has seen a string of alleged plots inspired by the Islamic State. Cells have been discovered in Delhi, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh and Kerala. The network we have seen which carried out the Rameshwaram cafe bombing is just the latest of a long string of groups, many of which have been foiled before they could carry out an attack, but many others which have succeeded in carrying out various kinds of low-grade activity. Each of these cells has failed to graduate to the level of the Indian Mujahideen, partly because Pakistan has shut its doors under international pressure to foreign fighters. But even if these groups haven't developed the wherewithal to stage major terrorist attacks, the impulse has remained. There are, of course, various reasons for why someone becomes a jihadist. Religious fundamentalism, also complex personal problems, but also the failure of Indian secularism. To some young Muslims, democracy and democratic institutions have failed to address the problems Indian Muslims have faced in the decades after partition, particularly from the early 1980s when under Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, the Congress began pulling out of its secular commitments and large-scale riots broke out in many parts of North India. As greater numbers of educated young Muslims have entered the market economy, the problem has accelerated. To many of these, this generation, it appears that their problems have become worse and that society is turning its face on them. Segregation in housing, the separateness of social lives and culture and the lack of consociational arrangements that is social institutions in which people of all religions are involved creates a sense of ghettoization and fear which feeds jihadism. Jihadism of the kind we have seen in Bangalore and before still exists as I said only on the fringes. But it is worth considering where it might lead and what India needs to do to prevent it from becoming a fire that might consume the country. I am Praveen Swami and I am a contributing editor at The Print. Thank you for watching Print Explorer this week.